Good evening and welcome. My name is Richard Leventhal. I'm the Executive Director of the Penn Cultural Heritage Center. I'm very pleased to welcome you to the Penn Museum tonight for a very exciting um, activity and performance. Um, as we get started, I'd like to thank, first to begin to thank our sponsors for tonight's activities. First, I'd like to thank the Sac and Fox Nation. I'd also like to thank Penn Museum, Penn Cultural Heritage Center, Penn's Native American and Indigenous Studies Initiative, the Albert M. Greenfield Intercultural Center here at Penn, the Department of Anthropology at Penn, and the Native American Voices, the people here and now exhibit here at the Penn Museum. To begin the program, I'd like to invite Pastor John Norwood to come to the podium. He is Nanakoke Lenny Lenape tribe, part of the Lenny, excuse me, Nanakoke Lenny Lenape Tribal Nation of Bridgeton, New Jersey. And he is a councilman and tribal judge, and he will present a convocation and welcome. Perhaps I'll stand on the side here. It is an honor to be able to welcome you to the land of the Lenape, Lenape Hoki. I am grateful to the curators of the museum, the leaders of this event, our dignitaries from across Indian country, many of whom are national level leaders and artists. I'm honored to have representatives of the Sac and Fox Nation, and especially members of the family of an American hero. I want to once again say that on behalf of the Nanticoke Lenny Lenape Tribal Nation, we're blessed to have you in our homeland, and that indeed we are still here. I've been asked to give a blessing, which I will do at this time, and those of you who can stand, I invite you to do so. Thank you very much. And to begin tonight, we'll also now have a short film clip entitled Jim Thorpe, the World's Greatest Athlete. This is a short piece of the film. It was a film made by documentary producer and, and director Tom Weidlinger and Joseph Brujak. In 1999, the Joint Resolution of Congress recognized the athlete of the 20th century. It was a man today many have never heard of, an Indian from Oklahoma named Jim Thorpe. It was the times to educate the Indian, to get away from being heathens, and learn to eat with a knife, fork, and spoon. 
it was not a real comfortable existence for many of those homesick children. And quite frankly, I found out that Jim Thorpe was one of many Indian children. When they got the opportunity, they were heading out of Dodge. These guys were practicing high jump. And nobody could get over that bar. And so they went over the top of the bar. And had a couple inches of spare. And Warner saw that. So he nailed that. I personally think that the Ooring Indians, the Canton Bulldogs, were teams that probably introduced people to pro football. Coming to big league like he did, I thought he was a hell of a ball player. Fast. He could do anything. He's the only Olympic athlete to ever participate in 17 events. Won the decathlon. And also he won the pentathlon. You know, people were mystified. Dad had a very sad personal life. He lost his twin. He lost his mother. He lost his father. His first son. He lost his first child. I know Dad would say, uh, put those medals in those trophies. They're going to carry life. It's going to be a place carry life. You can't be placed in I think if there was really any hurt, that's where it came from, was the, the people that he trusted turned him around to save their own careers. It's a legend. Legend in any time. Listening to my dad, he says, uh, if there's anybody that can outrun you, it's Jim Thorpe. Whenever I get down and tired sometimes, I used to always think about it in my mind about Jim Thorpe doing what he did, and it would motivate me to just keep running and just keep going. And with that, we'd like to now set up for the play reading. And as we do that, I'd like to give a little context between what you just saw and today. Is in 1953, Jim Thorpe dies. And Jim Thorpe's human remains are then taken to the town of Mokchunk in East Mokchunk in north central Pennsylvania for, for the creation of a memorial to the athlete. And the towns are then renamed Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania. In 1990, we have the passage of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act as a federal law. In 2010, Jim Thorpe's son, Jack Thorpe, initiated a lawsuit for the return of his father's remains under NAGPRA. In 2011, after Jack had died, Jim Thorpe's other sons, William and Richard, are joined by the Sac and Fox Nation of Oklahoma to continue the lawsuit. In 2013, the federal court ruled in favor of the Thorpe brothers and the tribe the borough, that the borough was in fact a museum and the remains should be returned. In 2014, the Third Circuit U.S. Appeals Court reversed that decision. And in 2015, the Appeals Court declined to rehear the appeal from the Thorpe family and the tribe. And that's where we are today. So I'd like to now turn to the actors as we hear, as we hear the play reading My Father's Bones, and the play is by Suzanne Schoen Harjo, and Suzanne is in the back of the room, and will be participating in the panel discussion um, a little bit later, and by Mary Catherine Nagel, who is in the front. In addition, the actors are Zach Morris, Joe Cross, William Zielinski, Dave Johnson, Colleen Cochran, and Ray Labadee will be reading the stage directions. My Father's Bones by Suzanne Schoen Harjo and Mary Catherine Nagel. Sac and Fox Nation, Jack stands in the northeast corner of the cemetery. He is surrounded by tombstones, each one displaying the name of a sibling, aunt, uncle, grandparent, or other relative. So here we are. This is it. These are the trees that surrounded me. 
Can you hear them? The birds. These are the birds that sang to him. Oh, and the sky, that big pink Oklahoma sky, and the dirt, the red earth. This is the dirt my dad played in, you know, when he was a kid. This is home, my home, his home. We were born in this dirt, and when we die, we go back to this dirt, or at least that's what dad wanted. Grandma and grandpa, they're here now. Over there, that's that's my auntie, my dad's brother, my uncle, some of my cousins. My dad's twin died when he was nine. He's here. We're all here, except Dad. They took him, buried him someplace else, far away from here, someplace he'd never, ever been before. You see, my dad, you may know him, or maybe you think you know him. Sure, he was famous, and yeah, he won some gold medals in the Olympics. But that didn't change who he was. To my dad, he was always second thoughts. That's one thing you should know about us Indians. We're no different than you white people. We want to bury our loved ones with our loved ones. Our mothers. Our fathers. I spent years trying to bring dad back. I begged. I pleaded. I prayed. And when that didn't work, I did what all you white folks do all the time. I filed a lawsuit. October 23rd, 2014, borough of Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania. Mayor Michael Sofranco sits at his desk on the phone. Thanks, Scott. See you Sunday. He hangs up as his secretary enters. My father's name was Watohuk, or as you would say in English, the bright path that lightning makes as it goes across the sky. To me, he was dad, but to the world, he was the most incredible athlete of the 20th century. Most remember him for the gold medals that he won in the 1912 Olympics. He won both the decathlon and the pentathlon, a feat no one's ever been before. His scores in the combined 15 events were off the charts. He set records that took decades to break. But I remember Dad for football. As an Indian kid, he was sent to school at Carlisle. And it was there at Carlisle that Eisenhower saw him play. The president said later, here and there, there are some people who are supremely endowed, but my memory goes back to Jim Thorpe. He never practiced in his life, and he could do anything better than any other football player I ever saw. That's not entirely true. Dad practiced. Sometimes on Saturdays, when we weren't in school, 
He would take us out back and throw the football around. You know, I was the youngest. And just let me say that Bill and Richard, they could always outplay me. But Dad always threw to me first before he threw to my older brothers. October 23rd, 2014, Bill Thorpe and Steve Ward's Tulsa Law Office. Steve Ward holds a copy of the Third Circuit Court of Appeals decision. So when we were filing the Tulsa Circuit Court lawsuit, I took that to the court granted the matter to the Circuit Court of Appeals to explain to them that he might win. Steve thought we won the war. We did. We did win. But we are not possible because unlike you, we are Jesuit. And we are only out there. know what to do. And that day I filed this lawsuit because we were scared we would win. The district court and the circuit court had promptly granted our motion for summary judgment. We lost. And I think I litigated a lot of cases in the district court on summary judgment. But we did not win. And I think the merits of that are still hard. They are my dad. They exit as Michael Sofranco and Secretary enter the mayor's office in the borough of Jim Thorpe. I wasn't sure, but then again, I'm not a lawyer. And as a common citizen, I only start a contract as a contract, no matter how you slice it, right? We lost in the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. The three judges that decided the borough's appeal overturned the district court judge, concluding that he got it wrong. According to the Third Circuit, NAGPRA doesn't apply to my dad's remains. NAGPRA, you know what that is? Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. It's a little thing Congress put together back in 1990 for our civil rights, for Native American human rights, when Congress found out about a serious problem in America. For some reason, Native folks, non-Native folks in America think they should be able to, to buy and sell our Native ancestors, our remains, our bones, our skulls. Some scientists were digging up our, our skulls to study them. Some were collecting our bones for trophies. Others were using them as tourist attractions. But we're human. We're people. And just like all you other folks, we have the inalienable right to be buried in the same soil as our relatives or to have our ashes sent the many different directions. 
NAGPRA recognized that we had that right. NAGPRA requires non-native entities who purchase the remains of our native people to return them to us so we can bury them, so we can put our relatives to rest in the way they want. Have you ever had your deposition taken? What the heck? Michael Sofranco enters and moves to the table with chairs. Steve Ward sits across from him. October 23rd, 2012, Lehighton, Pennsylvania. The court reporter enters and sits, typing every word that's spoken. I wanted to interrupt. So by having one common name, you can tie plural, and then second. But of course I didn't. One final question. I wanted to ask. Do you have proof of this contract claim to have not been made? Why won't you let my dad come home? There was a contract. July 16th, 2012, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Bill enters and takes his place. You'll be great.
William Schwab enters and sits on the other side of the table. The court reporter remains, typing every word that's spoken. Bill takes his seat at the table. Bill, you don't need me to say. You already said it. I'm the attorney for the borough of Jim Thorpe. I ask you as requested today. Now you you filed the complaint. Is it that you claim that your father's remains were shopped to several cities? My father's Conversation with your father about the burial. Did your dad have a will? And the estate was great for him. An estate was great for him? You don't know. Were you aware that Patsy entered into a contract with the borough of Lost and Chuck and Chuck and a lease to Lost and Chuck on May 13, 1934? Objection. Were you aware that the two boroughs? would be binding on the heirs, administrators, and executors as far as long as the borough of Long Chunk and Long Chunk of Lisa Two are officially known or designated.
understanding Once an Indian is buried in a sanctified land, and that's why it's not sacred, then his soul is at rest. Is that your understanding? Well, I don't know if that really would be. I mean, it isn't very old in Buddhism. I mean, it's just like the church is like there, but so often. So his first ceremony was never to you? Never to me. When your half-sister Grace came to you, someone would show you that it was a sacrifice, in other words, if you were to witness that it was a sacrifice. No, we don't need you to show us what is and is not sacrifice. I, I know, know what sacrifice. sacrifice. You are the sacrifice. A sacrifice burial ceremony lasts four days. The fourth day is important. That's when the elders hold the naming ceremony. Maybe you've never experienced anything like this. But these are our traditions. We have two spirits. We have our big spirit. And we have our little spirit. And when you pass, the elder gives your little spirit a name. That says to your little spirit, it's okay. You can go on now. Before my father's passing, no one had ever interrupted a second fox burial. So when Patsy walked in there, we didn't know what to do. We just sat there in shock. I remember I had my brother Bill next to me, my relative Henrietta. She was on my right. And suddenly, out of nowhere, this white guy bursts in. Henrietta gasped. Bill grabbed my hand. We knew something was wrong. The white guy, he came in the wrong door. The door he came through, that's the door for death. Only the dead come in and out of that door. January 2011. Just a few dispositions, and then we'll file for summary judgment. So it's almost over. I was hoping you'd take over. Over? You know, be named plaintiff. Instead of you? Instead of me. You're ready for this. I didn't know nothing about NAGPRA. You don't need to. We have a lawyer, a good lawyer. Who is doing a great job. I'm dying. I have cancer. Well, as your doctor said, it's a matter of months. I won't be here. Someone has to bring dad home. You do? Bury him next to me. It wasn't easy, you know, deciding to file the lawsuit. I really had to think about it. Is this what dad would have really wanted? But then he always said all he ever wanted was to be buried in sacrifice next to his twin brother, his parents. So when I met with my attorney, I said, file it. Steve Ward enters. File the lawsuit. I'm sure. It'll take a long time. I don't care if it takes the rest of my life. Well, you got some money. I don't care about money. You don't care about your brother. If it were your dad, what would you do? File it. File it. The 
before I filed the suit, I tried. When I was principal chief, I made several trips. And each time, the answer was the same. Mayor enters and sits in his office, Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, 1986. I'd like to collect my father, please. Come up here again. Principal Chief Thorpe. Of the Second Fox Nation. I'm here to collect my father. He's going back to Oklahoma. I'm afraid that's not possible. My dad's been up with us for 50 years now. It's time for him to come home. He signed a contract. My dad never signed anything. What you did? This isn't what he wanted. Need to finish his burial. This isn't his home. His name is Watohuk. May 19th, 1954, East Mawchunk, Pennsylvania. Mayor sits in a chair in his office. Patsy enters. I have a contract here. Hold on. Mayor hands Patsy the contract to read. Nineteen fifty three, Sack and Fox Nation. Jim Thorpe's funeral. Jack, now sixteen years old, and Bill, now twenty five, stand together. Jesus, uh, Kim Ma, who may nay, Jesus, uh, Kim Ma, who may nay, me and no, hey, nay, Jesus, uh, Kim Ma, who may nay, Jesus, uh, Kim Ma, who may nay, me and no, hey, nay, oh. Way yo Timmy to yo nay, ni a na nay, hit the shim a ma, who may nay, ni a na, hey. Highway patrolman has entered and the music has stopped. Patsy enters. What are you doing? You can't take him. Patsy exits, followed by Bill and Jack. Highway patrolman follows Patsy, coffin in tow. Return to present day, the cemetery where everything began, Sack and Fox Nation. Bill enters, he carries some prayer tobacco. He stands in front of Jack's grave.
Jack enters and stands in the cemetery with Bill. End of play. Very much. I'd also like to recognize um, the director, Matt Pfeiffer. Matt, could you please stand up? And then also like to recognize the playwrights, Mary Catherine Nagel, and in the back, Suzanne Schoenharjo. Thank you very much all. Um, we'll take about a five minute break as we reset the stage and then we'll have our panel discussion about NAGPRA and about some of the issues that were raised in this play. Uh, so please uh, just take five minutes if you need to go to the bathroom or just to sit as we reset things. Thank you very much.
doesn't really matter, but I can't hear any whispers, so as long as everybody talks loudly enough for me to hear you. <laughs> actors marvelous job thank you so much can we give them another round of applause <laughs> Thank you. 
Sorry, thank you very much. Um, about uh, an important law that's dealing with a past wrong, about grave robbing, but also about the movement of human remains from where they were interred in the ground uh, into museums for, for study and for the, for the collection. It, at the very beginning in 1990, and even before that, it was a controversial law. Many museums, many archaeologists, anthropologists were very concerned about this. It was perceived that this was a law, in fact, that was going to steal things from museums, not about righting a wrong. I think today, in fact, however, museums and researchers have begun to embrace this law. Because, in fact, I think we've begun to embrace not only the law, but also the concept of return and the value of return. Because I think it's, we've found that it's, it, is a, it is of great value. One of the interesting things that I have found is it does not necessarily impose solutions to these past problems, but it mandates, in fact, a conversation. It mandates an interaction between museums and Native American communities. And here at Penn Museum, such conversations have led to many exchanges of knowledge between both Native American communities and museums and researchers. And so I'd like this conversation about NAGPRA to move forward so that we can have a greater understanding about both the law, about interactions with Native American communities, about important research and our understanding about the past, to all move forward together rather to in, fight, in fact be fighting with each other. This is how we can learn about both the past and think about the present and think about the future. So what I'd like to do is to turn to our panelists and ask each of them talk for about five minutes, five, six minutes. After, after that, I'd like, perhaps we can have an internal conversation and then I'll open up the floor for questions. In addition, since we are doing a live stream of this today, if there are questions um, out there in, away from Penn and, and it's sent in via Twitter, I will make sure that we can pass these along and perhaps we can answer some of those also. I'm sorry? It's hashtag Jim Thorpe. So if you can send those questions in, we will try to answer those also and discuss some of those issues. So let me turn first, to, uh, let me introduce our panelists. Um, on the far right is Suzanne Schoenharjo uh, that you've already met. Next to her, <coughs> excuse me, next to her is Lucy Fowler Williams, who is curator here at the Penn Museum. And then we have, there's also Sandra K. Massey, who is the Historic Preservation Officer for the Sac and Fox Nation. Then there is Principal Chief George Thurman, who Principal Chief of the Sac and Fox Nation. And last right here is John Echo Hawk, who is the Director of the Native Americans Rights Fund. Uh, let me start, let me ask George Thurman, who is the Principal Chief of the Sac and Fox Nation, to begin. George. Okay, thank you. A lot to display this evening brought back a lot of memories. I remember when Jack came forth, sat down with the business committee of the Second Fox Nation, asking the tribe, the nation, to join in to this lawsuit. And we knew why, because of an after law would strengthen this case. And we, we, we didn't have to discuss it very long at all for five minutes of business committee. We just agreed and said, work with them and help do funding of the uh, attorneys. <clears throat> this isn't the first case, but it is one of the most important because of the people and name that's involved in this case. Why it's so, it's gone nationwide. It's really drawn the attention. I've received a lot of messages and encouragement from a lot of different tribal leaders across the United States and saying, you know, that they're with us, supporting us spiritually and with prayers. So I was involved with another case with Sandra when we were before the state of Missouri and we had a arbitration there and we won this case. So this, when we got the word that the circuit 
have denied our request for a rehearing it would be very very hard to accept and it's it's still not really sunk in yet but we were so confident that it was important to be brought home once and for all there were plans made the family had talked to us but behind all this we listened to the family we let them take the lead because not once did we ever say we were doing it. It was the family that asked us to be a part of it, so that's what we were doing. And again, it comes to that this state not understanding what NAPA is about or what being a Native American is about. That's educating we're making a push back in Oklahoma to get this uh, before become a law to where everyone, future leaders, future judges, future citizens learn about Native Americans, how the governments operate, their history. So that's what needs to be done here. And I think if these judges had, had a different training background, could have been a big difference here in, in this case. So that's uh, one thing that needs to be done. It needs to be brought forth to educating what Native Americans are about, not what you see in the movies from the past. Uh, the Thorpe family, they've been a, a big, that name has been a big factor within the history of the Sacramento. We brought honor to our nation because when he won those medals, he wasn't even a U.S. citizen at the time. He was a sacrifice. We did not, but we did not gain citizenship until later as a Native American. So he brought that honor to our nation by representing us first and then the United States second. Although he that's unique. We have dual citizenship. But back to NAMPRA, it's very, very important act because I am a direct descendant of Black Hawk. You go around Illinois, Iowa, in that Great Lakes region, and you see that name everywhere. It's on automotive shops. Just like what they were talking in the play, well, they named so-and-so this business after Jim Thorpe. But, uh, but Blackhawk, he was, um, again, the body was taken and not sure whatever became of the body. But uh, we're not even, to this day, we're not even sure if he was laid to rest properly. So that's, it's, it's only not just with sacrifice, but with tribes throughout the United States. And with the the passage of this law, a lot of things have been changing in our favor. So it just needs to be brought forth more. I was testifying before Congress and a uh, representative from Pennsylvania was there. And when I brought forth who I was representing Sacred Fox Nation, I mean, tribe of uh, Jim Thorpe, he interrupted. And if you're testifying before Congress, they got a green light to and they started and then when it gets to red, it comes and cut it off. And that was my time to testify about what we wanted, what we needed to sacrifice. And he started talking about Jim Thorpe. Whenever I mentioned Jim Thorpe, he said, yeah, Jim Thorpe, he was from Pennsylvania, wasn't and all that. I just looked at him and I thought, you're cutting into my time. You're not even accurate. So I just said, we'll discuss it after I get through with my testimony. So see, that's what I'm saying is the educating everyone what NAP was about and how it can help the families. That's where it goes first, the family, like in the Thorpe family. And I visited with Bill and Richard along with some tribal leaders, and uh, it was 
big disappointment to them. Pop them over the phone, and I'm just still kind of in shock right now. So that's you know that I'm trying to give a quick overview of what NAMPA means to the Sacred Cross Nation. So and afterwards, if you plan to visit with anyone or if you're a question or answer, feel free to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much. I could turn now to Sandra K. Massey, the Historic Preservation Officer for the Sac and Fox Nation. Sandra. Okay, thank you. Um, NAGPRA means to me that the museums have been forced to deal with the tribes on a one-to-one -one basis because just like George said, they need to be educated. And people who don't know us fear us. They were thinking we were going to steal everything, you know, and, that, and it's not art to be stolen. It's ours, you know, it's what, what belonged to us and was stolen from us, including our people. And that's what NAGPRA does. It's forcing them to look at us as people. And it, it can bring about change. I mean, this very university fought with us with our first repatriation in Pennsylvania. We even used that as part of this case. They fought with us. They kept, and it's nobody here. Um, I got to say that, you know, because one of the things I did want to bring out is here we are sitting at this university. They've given us a voice. They've given us a place to express what we want to think, what we're saying, what this means to us. And it's the university that first fought with us. So it can change. Once they know us, they can change. They start to understand where we're coming from. And they have to look at us as people. They start to understand that we are people. Just like George mentioned, we had a lawsuit with the state of Missouri. We, it was that was really bad. I used to say they were the best and the worst. The best was the federal, you know, the federal agencies who followed the law. The worst were the state agencies who didn't. But the state agencies learned, and now they're starting to think like us. There are things that happen, natural occurrences that we're going to see as a sign that they're starting to see as signs because they understand us now. They understand how we're going to look at things and think, and they know that because they had to talk to us because of the law. And that law forced them to talk to us. I mean, they did not discuss anything with us before NAGPRA. And NAGPRA, like I said, is forcing people to look at us as people. But even after NAGPRA was passed in 1992 in the very state where there are 39 tribes, somebody went into the cemetery where my own grandparents are buried and dug up the body of a stillborn baby who was also part of my family. This happened after NAGPRA passed because they, where they looked at us as a curiosity. This was a tribal cemetery that was set back in the woods, so some local boys thought it was okay to go in there and dig up somebody. And this case has a name attached to it, but we fight just as hard for anybody that's of our tribe. This case is showing what it's, and this play that is part of this, showing that what this case is doing is showing the, the um, effects it's having on a family and on a people, because it's very personal to us. We're not just, you know, well, these people were far away. They are our grandparents. They are our aunts and uncles. That's how close they are to us even now. So right now, yeah, I'm a little angry. <laughs> I'm, kind of, I'm trying to keep it down, because um, I know I only have a few minutes. So um, I don't want him to start. I guess he, <laughs> he said he would tell us, that, you know, we're cutting it short, because once I get started, I can make your eyes roll back in your head for how long I can talk without taking a breath. But that's what NAGPRA means to me, and that's what this case is. It's showing, it's highlighting that, yes, even in what may be considered a more modern time, we still do adhere to our tribal ways. We still do, in fact. Um, just this dress what I'm, that I'm wearing is new that I wore for the naming of my new niece. We still do these things. She had a naming ceremony. She got an Indian name. That's part of the culture that Jim Thorpe was part of. That's part of the culture he wanted a tribal traditional burial. And they're saying, well, th did he write this down? You know what? 60 years later, I told my brother, just like Jim Thorpe did, I didn't write it down. I really didn't even have to tell my brother. He's going to know because that's the way I live. But we don't have to write things down. We tend not to because, well, when we write things down and get stolen and put, taken out of context, things like that, we say you have to learn by doing. So, no, we didn't write it down. So he followed a traditional tribal way by not you know, not writing it down. He told his brother. So if he weren't famous, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. He would be at home right now. He wasn't taken from 
you know, I mean, he wasn't stolen. He, uh, I mean, he was stolen. He was taken away from his ceremonies, which has never happened to us before. And by the decision that the Pennsylvania judges made, they're saying that a town has more right to a man's body than his own family. He's got two living sons who are saying, no, this isn't what we want. This isn't what, what he wanted. And they would know. He told them. He told their uncles. He told the family. And, you know, it's been so long. Even before there was an actual lawsuit filed, Jack has been trying for years. So what does it take for a son to bring his father home? Thank you very much. I'd like to turn to John Echohawk, director of the Native American Rights Fund. John. The Native American Rights Fund is a National Indian Legal Defense Fund. It started 45 years ago as a nonprofit organization to raise funds, hire lawyers, and make them available to our Indian people. Uh, for legal representation in, uh, in their most important cases because most of our people were poor and we didn't have any lawyers. So we started taking those mis most important cases and one of the issues that came up was this repatriation issue. Uh, the basic problem is uh, everybody in this country but us had the, had the right to uh, protect uh, the remains of their ancestors and to bury them with them except for us. started taking that to court and we started winning and we finally got to the point where there were so many cases going on around the country that it led to uh, the Congress taking this issue up and passing the Native American Grace Protection Repatriation Act that basically gave us the same rights as other people in this country to control the, the remains of our ancestors and their, and their burial grounds. because uh, so many of the museums that had the remains of our people had uh, come to uh, uh, possess them on the assumption that there weren't any Indians around to care about the remains of their ancestors and, and, and their burial goods because somehow we were the vanished Americans so it didn't really matter because still here. And that's basically what the courts came to realize and what the Congress came to realize. So the Indians had to deal with the, the, the Repatriation Act and one of the, the things that the Native American Rights Fund to be involved in, in the passage of that, uh, of that legislation and, and the implementation. That implementation goes on case in that implementation. There haven't been that many uh, cases since the act was passed interpreting and implementing it because it's gone along fairly smoothly but uh, of course uh, this case has presented uh, this controversy and the courts have had to wrestle with it and it's been difficult for the courts up here in this uh, Third Circuit Court of Appeals up here in this area because there are no tribes in the Third Circuit judges up here aren't really used to dealing with these issues and uh, we did do the big one for them and the law really was pretty clear the, the district court didn't really write it down but looked at the definition of a, of a museum in the act it's an institution or a state and local government agency that has uh, our remains and burial grounds and that's the plural of, of Jim Thorpe Agency. It's a national agency, so it's it's pretty clear. So that's what the district court said uh, applies to the borough of Jim Thorpe. But the Third Circuit looked at that and said, "Well, this 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 just can't be." You know, and it, it ends up with an absurd result. They called it an absurd result. So they just kind of threw the law out the window.
educational process that we've talked about, the continual process for our people that we face in this country and the Jews and the Congress listens and listens to us and not all these judges understand who came out and play in it. These days before this U.S. Supreme Court, we lose over 90% of our cases because we've got two justices that don't really understand the issues and they're all afraid to go there anymore. We used to be like that, but here's today with the conservative majority in that court. about Turn now to Suzanne Harja, who's the president of the Morningstar Institute. Suzanne. Thank you, Richard, and thanks to everyone at the museum for giving us this forum and for participating with us in repatriations and repatriation forums over the many years. Uh, it's been a very productive and progressive uh, relationship, and I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks to the actors and to the director who did such a stellar job for us. Um, NAGPRA is, uh, it is a difficult law to understand, and I'm not surprised that the Third Circuit judges got it wrong, but they really got it wrong. Now, my Cheyenne brother, Ben Nighthorse Campbell, who started off in, in the U.S. House and went on to the Senate, was one of the original sponsors of NAGPRA. And he told them in an amicus brief, you got it wrong. He said it ever so nicely, but he said, you got it wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. I do. I was one of the original sponsors. I was there. And I'm here to tell you, as myself, that I'm one of the original people who um, uh, thought up this whole strategy of cultural rights law that um, we've been uh, chasing since 1967. Uh, we had a, a gathering after ceremonies at Fair Butte, South Dakota. And which is a very important place to, to about 60 different Native nations, uh, including the Cheyennes and uh, they call it Nawabos, Holy Mountain. And it's where a very important Cheyenne prophet, Sweet Medicine, received visions and reordered all of Cheyenne society as a result of it. So it was a good place to begin discussions about the things that had been troubling people's dreaming and waking times about our dead relatives who were being held hostages in holding repositories around the country. Uh, our returning Vietnam vets at that meeting in 67 were particularly concerned with that, and they call them prisoners of war. He said, our dead relatives are right, are, are there in these uh, museums and schools and roadside attractions and all the other places where they're being held, they're being held as prisoners of war, and we want to get them back, and we have to think of this as really a, a, a pretty massive rescue mission. And in 1967, I will tell you that there were more dead Native people in the holding repositories of the United States of America than there were living Native people. And that's about equalized now. 
it's a difficult act because it deals with individual rights, with religious rights, with cultural rights, with rights that predate the United States of America, that predate any non-Native person setting foot on this red quarter of Mother Earth. And it deals also with individ with the with the with the group rights, with the native people's rights. So the individual rights are people who are a part of the group, who are a part of the nation, who are a part of the Pueblo, whatever the group might be, the society, the dogwood society, the kitlock society, uh, whatever clan. Uh, they might be a part of whoever has the right to a particular sacred object or cultural patrimony uh, or the people who are the next of kin or the lineal descendants. So, and in some of this, it, it, it kind of gets all jumbled up. And before we could get to the repatriation uh, laws themselves uh, and to the crafting of those, we really had to deal with, with something that would reverse the civilization regulations, which are uh, terrible, terrible regulations that were illegally uh, promulgated and, and carried out over a 50-year period in the United States uh, by the executive uh, branch of, of the United States from the 1880s to the 1930s, and these civilization regulations just very briefly uh, outlawed everything that was traditional of Native peoples. Dances, hairstyles, everything, ceremonies. And it uh, interrupt, provided for the interruption of, of, uh, of uh, funeral proceedings and the like. So we had to do something to to change that, and first we had to get the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, which uh, is a policy umbrella uh, piece of legislation where the United States declared that it is the policy of the United States to preserve and protect Native American traditional religions. The first federal repatriations were done under the Religious Freedom Act of 78, in 78 and 79, and going forward. And we didn't really fully come up with the fully draft and, and concoct the um, repatriation laws until 89 and 90. 89 went to just the Smithsonian repatriation at the Smithsonian Institutions, and 1990 went to everyone else. Every other institution in the country that had a federal nexus. If you had received some sort of federal aid or money, uh, you had some sort of federal tie, uh, as in the borough of Jim Thorpe. It receives federal money. Uh, and so this went to not just museums or educational institutions or federal agencies, but all the holding repositories, whether they're named or not, the historical societies, and these ghastly roadside attractions. And that's what this is, ghastly or not a roadside attraction. And it, um, it, it really takes me back to uh, what the veterans said in 1967, that we're on a rescue mission dealing with the prisoners of war here. And um, if this were any other race, it would not be permissible. It would not be allowed against the wishes of the family and against the wishes of the people of that person. It would never be allowed. But here it is allowed. And why? Because it's Native Americans and it's our ancestors. And our ancestors think things have been allowed against us that have been heinous, that have been outrageous, that have been um, anti-human. So 
NAGPRA is one of those laws that Congress has, has adopted that seeks to balance the equities. Nothing can ever, ever, ever make up for the horrible things that have been done to us and to our ancestors. Nothing. Somewhere you have to start and say, here's some small measure of justice in the modern era. Well, that's what this is. It's human rights, civil rights for Native Americans. It's not human rights for scientists. It's not human rights for museums or towns or boroughs. It's not human rights for anyone except Native American peoples, both nations and individuals. So that's what we're upholding uh, when we uphold this. And I, I have to point out, I guess, that, that Congress passed NAGPRA without a dissenting voice. Not one person of all the members of Congress said, no, I don't like this or I don't understand it. They all started out not understanding it, except Ben Nighthorse Campbell. Everyone else did not understand it. They came to an understanding, and once they understood, they agreed on what they were going to do, and they adopted it unanimously in both houses. So this is a, a very strong and solid uh, piece of legislation. Uh, I hope that um, you all will have your sharpest questions uh, for us, uh, because that's just the kind of question we like to answer. Thank you very much. Suzanne, thank you very much. And let me turn now to Lucy Fowler Williams, curator here at the Penn Museum. Lucy. Thank you. Um, I want to start by thanking you all for coming. It's really terrific to um, imagine that we are here having a panel about NAGPRA. Many of us in the room have worked at the museum for many on NAGPRA, so we are really thrilled to be talking to you and to have seen your wonderful show. Um, I really am quite moved by how many people came to see it. I also want to thank Richard Leventhal for his real energy and support in developing this panel and bringing everybody here. It's always expensive to have two black people talking to you, so it's really terrific that our guests came and that we're all here together to discuss NAGPRA and to learn more in this setting in the next few years. So I have prepared a couple of notes, and I'm sorry to read them, but I think it's better for me to do that because you'll get a better sense of how we use NAGPRA and what we're trying to do with it. Um, as John and Suzanne and others have already explained, NAGPRA provides a legal mechanism for federally recognized tribes, Native Alaskan corporations, and Native Hawaiian organizations to make claims for human remains certain categories of objects held by museums that receive federal funding. In complying with the law, the Penn Museum acknowledges the historical and political context of, indigenous, of Indian people in the United States and recognizes tribal rights of self-determination in regard to the control of human remains, sacred objects, and objects of cultural patrimony. The law encourages museums to confront our colonialist past and to create a new and more inclusive future. It acknowledges that Indian peoples have a legitimate interest in the preservation of ancestral Indian remains in their own homes. In addition to human remains, four categories of objects are identified in the law. And we, we know these in, from the law as associated funerary objects, unassociated funerary objects, objects of cultural patrimony, and sacred objects. And as I hope my comments will show tonight, NAGPRA also offers really important opportunities, like this one, for establishing mutually beneficial relationships between museums and tribes. Since its passage in 1990, the Penn Museum has worked rigorously to implement NAGPRA. It has established a representation office and a NAGPRA committee to assist in the compliance process. All claims are submitted in writing to the museum director, who forwards them to the repatriation office. Viable claims are brought forward to the committee, which makes, rec which makes recommendations to our director. In the case of human remains, a 
and associated literary objects. The trustees of the University of Pennsylvania authorize our director to repatriate any remains that meet the criteria specified by the author. The disposition of sacred objects and objects of cultural patrimony are subject to a determination by the trustees of the university. So the museum has to date, since 1990, mailed approximately somewhere between 2,500 and 3,000 letters to federally recognized tribes, informing them of our holdings and inviting them to consult with us on our collection. As of 2015, 47 formal repatriation claims seeking the return of collections have been received to the museum, and 26 repatriations have been completed, resulting in the transfer of 232 sexagenarian remains, 750 funerary objects, 14 unassociated funerary objects, 20 objects of cultural patrimony, 22 sacred objects, and two objects claimed as both categories, cultural patrimony and sacred objects. Ten claims are ongoing. Eleven claims are currently inactive, pending further information from tribes. We have also received, recently, two competing claims for objects in our collection. The 232 human remains have been repatriated to 15 different tribes across the country, with a majority of them to the Kivetch Alaska Corporation, and that's in southeastern area, in Alaska, in the area of Prince William Sound. Um, and that is the place where Dr. Frederica Delavina excavated extensively for many seasons in the 1930s. In addition, a large number of human remains from the Samuel Morton collection have been repatriated to Wahine and Alma in Hawaii. Of the 22 sacred objects, the majority of these were returned to Zuni Pueblo in 1990, prior to the passage of NAGPRA. And of the 20 objects of cultural patrimony, the majority of those are a set of masks from Graven, Alaska, that were also collected by Frederica Delavina in 1935. Um, it is important to note that there is no time limit on NAGPRA, and thus we expect to continue to receive claims as tribes gain experience with the law and as, that, as they prioritize their needs. Um, for your information, the museum has established a website to communicate our repatriation efforts to the public and to provide this phenomenal project. And you can find that link to that information on the website. Um, regarding human remains, I just wanted to um, give a couple of examples so that you understand the kind of work that is done to um, get these remains and to gain this information. In our experience, the majority of claims are for human remains. And tribes are clearly focusing their repatriation efforts in this area so that their people may reach peace of mind with healing the devastating effects of colonization on native cultural identity. The museum houses the Samuel Morton collection as well as human remains from the controlled excavation. To share one example, our most recent repatriation of human remains was to the Eastern Band of Cherokee in North Carolina. James Griffin and Tyler Howe, both historic preservation officers with the Eastern Band, traveled to Philadelphia to receive these human remains. As preservation officers, they have a profoundly serious responsibility to take possession of and to escort the human remains of their ancestors back to tribal territory, where they will be reburied as close as possible, often to the place where they are found. Griffin and Howe formally received six human remains from us on that occasion. Um, and these remains had been obtained from various sites by two medical doctors in the summer of 1838 and also in 1846. At that time, the remains were sent to, the, to Dr. Samuel P. Morton of Philadelphia for inclusion in his world study of human cranium. And Dr. Morton transferred them to the Academy of Natural Sciences here in Philadelphia in 1846. Some of the remains that Griffin and Howe received um, were the remains of children from a grave, from a cave burial. And as Griffin and Howe explained through our discussions that day, this form of burial was often practiced in the historic period when epidemics and forced removals resulted in the deaths of many Cherokee individuals. 
Another of the remains was described in its original 1846 documentation as, quote, an Indian known as one of the best ball players in his tribe. While playing ball, he slipped and fell and dislocated his spine and died immediately. Here, Griffin and Howe shared oral histories that they have um, received today in their community about one of the last ball games of 1845, during which three players were killed and several players were injured. They also shared additional information with which they asked us to keep confidential. We talked at length about the ball game and its continued importance in that community today. Later in the day, Griffin and Howe went on to examine the museum's ethnographic collections from their region, which had been acquired by Penn curators and anthropologists John Widoff and Frank Speck, who worked there in the 1930s. And as we completed our work together, they invited us to Cherokee down to the community to participate in their archaeology day. This is a seminar which they hold once a year to encourage the Cherokee students to get involved in archaeology. And after returning home, they emailed several photographs of their Cherokee stickball competitions that we used actually to enhance our new exhibition and to help visitors understand how the social aspects of the game help keep their community alive today. As they had explained earlier, they repeated the Cherokee word gadobu, which means to take care of the community. And that is the essence of what it means to be a Cherokee person. Regarding sacred objects and objects of cultural patrimony, many tribes across the country are also actively repatriating sacred objects, and OCP is what we call it for short, but I'm not going to call it that. As they are doing so, they are, are instructing their youth in tribal values and as a means of bringing the world into balance. To share one example, we have had several claims from plaintive clans in southeast Alaska. This is due to the fact that our assistant curator, Neil Shotridge, was a Tlingit native who purchased Tlingit collections, which he studied, exhibited, and then wrote about in our museum journal between 1913 and 1932. As a result, Penn Museum houses strong Tlingit collections of regalia, tools, and objects of everyday life. Through our NAGPRA consultation discussions, the Cultural Preservation Officer of the Central Council of Tlingit and Haida, Haida Indian Tribes of Alaska Mr. Harold Jacob has invited us to bring clan hats for use in specific potlatch celebrations where they could be witnessed, danced, and appreciated by clan members according to Tlingit protocol. With terrific support from the university on five occasions between 2003 and 2010, American section staff hand carried Tlingit clan hats to participate in these one to two day memorial celebrations. The eagle hat, the petrel hat, the raven of the roof hat, the shark helmet, and the wolf hat. Each traveled with their own seat assignments on airplanes and were welcomed and danced by clan members and later returned to Philadelphia. This has been a rewarding experience for the museum and which we have shared widely with our Philadelphia audiences. On these occasions, the Tlingit people have welcomed us into their <coughs> homes and treated us like family. To date, we have repatriated six Tlingit objects to one community, and we are engaged in discussions about making other objects available in our collection. In 2011 and 2012, we returned to Alaska to interview the, and film seven of our Tlingit colleagues in their homes and studios for inclusion in our new Native American Voices exhibition. Um, there are a couple of ongoing challenges, I would say, um, with NAGPRA here at the museum, and I thought I would give you a little bit of, of a sense of those. Um, while consultation is a just true amazing strength of the law, it can also be challenging because it requires us to do our due diligence and to contact all tribes who may have an interest in specific human remains before signing off on a repatriation to one particular group. So while some tribes are focused now on repatriation, many other tribes have other priorities. And this can sometimes slow down the process of repatriation. Um, while funding for our small NAGPRA office um, has been endowed with a gift from one of our longtime volunteers, Warren Kaminsky and his wife, Reseba, grant funds for tribes and museums definitely remain small. And many tribes call us, but they tell us that they can't come yet, but that they're working on, on, on that effort. 
um, we also have to be aware of the very practical problem of chemical pesticides, which were in some cases used as preservatives on museum collections made of organic materials, such as hides or plant materials. With the help of our conservation department, we've developed swabbing techniques as standard practice so that if objects once treated with, were once treated with harmful pesticides are returned to tribes, then we're able to share that information. On the whole, NAGPRA has provided tremendous opportunity for collaboration, and this area is a real priority for the Penn Museum. We are committed to building relationships with tribes where possible as a means to represent the vitality and diversity of Native American communities in the 21st century, and by involving Native peoples in the development of permanent exhibitions, educational programs, new acquisitions, and student internship. The museum currently displays our new Native American Voices Gallery, prepared with the assistance of four leading Native American advisors and over 70 Native American specialists, several of whom are here with us today, um, many of whom we have met through our repatriation efforts. Over 50 video clips of leading specialists developed with Hopi journalist Patty Tell and Mongo help bring the exhibition to life as do 30 written essays by Native American authors about objects in our collection. With the help of the Penn Teachers Institute, we've trained 12 Philadelphia school teachers who researched and developed new curriculum units for their schools about contemporary Native American peoples and issues inspired by the exhibit themes of local nations, sacred places, celebration and commemoration, new initiatives, language revitalization, and sovereignty. Student interns have been involved in the exhibit development, and recent and upcoming public programs have included Orin Lyons, Suzanne Harjo, Audra Simpson, and hip-hop artists Frank Wallen, Tall, Tall Paul, and Def I. As this collaborative project strengthen, enliven, and authenticate the museum's representation of Native peoples, we know that they also strengthen Native American communities by providing opportunities, access, and recognition often far from home. My hope is that the museum can be seen as a place that supports the Native community and that we will emerge with a better sense of the Penn Museum as a more inclusive, more respectful, and a more sensitive place to Native American issues. In closing, I want to share um, two statements that I've heard lately. Uh, the first one by James Sarmento, a Shasta Indian student who gave a talk here last week Heritage Center, and as James began his talk, he, he started by saying, and I quote, thank you for this safe place in which to talk about language reclamation. And last March, Nanakoke Lene Lenape, Chief Mark Guru from across the river in New Jersey, addressed the audience at our, at our exhibition opening celebration. And he said, I'm so pleased that the children in my community have a place where they can come to and feel like they belong. So I would argue that this is evidence of the changing museum, one of NAGPRA's greatest legacies. Thank you. Lucy, thank you very much. Um, just to remind people who are <clears throat> perhaps watching um, through their computer, hashtag Jim Thorpe on Twitter, and you can get your questions here, and hopefully we'll try to answer them. Let me begin. In, in, Mary Catherine, thank you very much for sending me this. But let me just read one of the things I think it's worthwhile following the play and also the discussion about uh, the borrow of Jim Thorpe is the definition of, of what a museum is from the statute itself, from the law. And this, is, this comes from Mary Catherine, who's in the audience, but she's popping it up to me on my iPad here. And this is the definition. Any institution or state or local government agency parentheses, including any institution of higher learning, close parentheses, that receives federal funds and has possession of or control over Native American cultural items. And then it says such term does not include the Smithsonian Institution, and that's because there's a different law for that, but that's completely separate. So it's a very broad definition of what a museum is. Let me, let me ask if I could both, and I think it's a question that perhaps many people have, I could ask Principal Chief um, George Thurman or to Sandra K. Massey, what are your thoughts about what, what are the next steps and what, where do, are you thinking of going ahead towards to the Supreme Court? 
in terms of the Jim Thorpe group? Um, we actually can't comment on that at this time. Okay. okay. Um, let me say our lawyer called me today, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I wasn't trying to put you on the spot. I just thought people were very interested in this issue and obviously wanted to know how, how you want to proceed. Uh, it's something that I think a lot of us are with encouraging you to move forward, but obviously there are a lot of issues in relation to the Supreme Court, as John has indicated and as others have indicated. So, uh, the Judicial Committee does still need to meet. Uh, they have a meeting this week, so no official uh, decision has been made. Okay, uh, there hasn't been, and we, we really want to sit down with uh, Richard and Bill, the two sons, and uh, <clears throat> go over this thoroughly with them and see what direction they they want to go. Okay, he's trying to reach out to me. We've we've done phone tag, and we haven't really talked face to face or over the phone yet. So hopefully, we'll be doing that before next week. Because I know there's a 90-day window within which one has to file. Um, let me let me ask another sort of broad question: Is there a sense that from 1990 to, to now, with NAGPRA, that there has been a uh, an opening up of museums, an opening up and an acknowledgement within the archaeological and anthropological community of the value and the importance of NAGPRA? Do you think that, that there has been a change from what was what 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 I think was a fairly a strong perception in 1990 and before that against the law to today. I think there's been a change. I'm not sure if, if, if you have seen that change. And I, anybody on the panel can answer. Suzanne, John, Sandra, George, I'll yield to you. I can say on uh, dividing with our NAGPRA representatives first, and um, definitely there's been a change. Like I said, with the, uh, we did have to take Missouri to court, but now they are they listen to us they you know see things that we could be interested in i mean they work with us um like i said this university has changed and given us the voice here and that's a big change that's very important i think that's what is that the one of the core uh, things of the law um we do have other museums that have you know of their own you know reached out and said well we think this is the right you know we're, we're going to take things off the court even though we haven't asked them to do that um you know we have had things taken off display and they've listened to us um, because we've said we this is not something that we do um so yes there's been um, a definite change yeah i want to it's not dip i mean uh that definitely has been a change but it doesn't necessarily deal with museums what I'm going to talk about real quick was but I get a lot of emails from towns and communities in our former tribal jurisdictional area up around the Great Lakes and they're consulting with us first before they move forth with any kind of a project whether it be building new homes or disturbing any of the land up there they're reaching out to us and I mean when I get those emails I learn how to deal with it on the uh, deal I forward it on to Sandra she in turn works with our sister tribes in Iowa and Kansas so yes there definitely has been a change because of that law good I would like to say too that uh, this issue has uh, has really gone international as well as you might guess. There are museums around the world that also have uh, the remains of our ancestors and burial goods and religious objects and uh, our tribes are reaching out around the world and basically kind of educating the world about these issues and some of these nations are having to think about their own neck for laws and that's kind of them so they're learning as well so this is really kind of going uh, international it's uh, supported too by the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples that the United Nations passed in 2006 and one of the uh, standards one of the principles that's recognized by the Declaration as the key uh, right of Indigenous Peoples is the right to communicate and educate with international Would you like to comment or 
We did several things in in crafting the law, NAGPRA. And the first thing we did was to um, require a change in, in the lexicon. And uh, instead of referring to bones and specimens and skeletons, and um, when you're dealing with law, you have to refer to our ancestors as human remains. Now that, it's often said that you can't legislate respect. That comes as close as legislating respect as uh, any law does, uh, because you have to use more respectful language. Uh, instead of um, talking about Brave goods, which is the language of pirates, um, we change that to funerary objects and funerary items, and uh, associated or not associated. And this associated or not associated, by the way, uh, when when the Smithsonian and the Army Medical uh, Museum used to advertise in the Rocky Mountain News and other newspapers for citizens to bring them um, grave goods and Indian crania and uh, they were inviting uh, grave robbing and they were inviting uh, desecration of, of all manner of, uh, of uh, resting places of our people and they um, they would, their custom was to, to divide up things, uh, human remains and, and funerary objects. They would just divide them uh, and, and uh, claim ownership uh, between the, the two. Uh, and by the way, the, the study of heads, uh, you know, the reason you don't hear of it much anymore is that after almost a century in the 1800s of, of uh, Europeans and Euro-Americans um, madly studying Indian heads and collecting them, and, and, um, and what would they do? Well, they would measure the skulls, weigh the brains, dip the skull in lye, and um, store it pass it around so people could look at it. Uh, in one case, the MODOC delegation found in the Smithsonian one of their scientists using one of the heads as um, an ashtray. These, um, what they, I mean, that was it. That was the whole study of heads, how, how big, how, how weighty. And you see in some of the literature uh, suggestions that people were killed for their heads. Uh, Mangus Coloradus, for example, you see people writing, he has a huge head. His head is huge, his head is huge. And he is eventually shot when he's in custody of the U.S. Army, and his uh, says, when, one, one ar army officer report is, um, uh, as soon as the shot body fell to the ground, I immediately decapitated it. <laughs> decapitated the head, uh, which is Stephen Smith forthwith. Uh, it, well, and, and, and weighed the brains and, and measured the skull and found though the skull were smaller, the, weight, the brain were larger than that of Daniel Webster. And that's a heck of a lot of information to have in your pocket in an outpost uh, where you have Mangus Coloradus as, as uh, your prisoner um, to know all of that 
is, is really pretty stunning. So I, I think that there's something to the, the suspicion that he was killed for his head. So uh, the study of heads goes on and on and on. And, and toward the end of the 1800s, they find that, that by calculating all of these um, um, measurements, that the French are not as smart as Cro-Magnon they are. Well, they say, sacre bleu. <laughs> the study of heads is out. <laughs> that it can't be a valid study if that was the conclusion. So they just retire that whole study and start transferring. Um, the Army Medical Museum transferred 4,500 skulls to the uh, Smithsonian. Uh, so. This this has a pretty grisly past. Uh, if you want to actually read something about this, uh, go to the, the National Anthropological Archives and read the Army officer reports of the of the um, Indian cranium study. Just that uh, I waited until cover of darkness till the grieving family left the graveside and um, exhumed the body and decapitated the head. Now imagine when that family came back. Well, imagine that army officer waiting until cover of darkness till the grieving family. He watched the family grieve. He watched the family grieve. He, he appreciated that as a human being as grief. And he did that anyway. And why? Because he was under orders to go out and harvest Indian cranium. His boss was the Army Surgeon General, and those were the orders he was given as an Army officer. So that was my ancestor, your ancestors, taxpayers, of <laughs> money at work. that kind of research for that kind of what turned out to be an idiot study. Thank you. Let me uh, let me open it up to some questions perhaps from the floor. If you could, uh, if you have a question, if you could stand up just and speak as loudly as you can. Please. Touch loud. Jim Thorpe is from Oklahoma. He was born in Oklahoma in Indian Territory, and uh, he came through Pennsylvania on tours, but he never was in what is now the borough of Jim Thorpe. Um, his wife came and took him away from his traditional ceremonies, and she didn't include the rest of the family in the contract that she signed with the borough because he was buried several years after he died because she was looking for a place. We say she was shopping around to the highest bidder. And so she did have a contract, but it was only binding on her and not the Thorpe sons and not anybody that, you know, he had children, his, um, the children of his other first two wives. Um, so he was never part of where he is buried now. Um, she was legally his wife, but what was ignored was the, you know, tribal tradition and what he wanted. Please. Could you, could you please?
Well, for cultural patrimony, it's um, how we define that was um, group ownership. And initially in our negotiations, we defined it um, as, as owned by a clan or a society or a moiety, a longhouse or a nation. And in the law, as written, it's um, by the Indian nation, by the native tribe. And it, um, so that that's one. And, and be, because of that group ownership, no one person can alienate it. So one person can't sell it all. Uh, because many of these holding repositories were uh, holding up a holding up a paper about bad title and saying, we have paper on it. And we were saying, sell it all. It, it couldn't have been alienated to begin with. So that's one thing about ownership. But as a general matter in, in NAGPRA, uh, it really isn't about ownership. It's about responsibility and who has responsibility for this particular sacred object or these human remains rather than ownership and the, the contract business is, is um, gets us back to that roadside attraction in a bad title. Jim Thorpe didn't like anything saying, hey, you can have my body and take it to a place I've never been. I'd like to actually also make just a sort of a broad comment. Um, I think one of the things to be thinking about in terms of museums and sort of in the 21st century is the contrast between the way we, we've, we've thought about museums, not only as repositories, but museums have been able to sort of stand up and say, we own a, a million objects. 500,000 objects, 20,000 objects, it makes no difference, whatever the number. And it's, a, and it's a concept of ownership. I think museums in the 21st century, and I think I'm thinking about this in terms of an international framing, I think museums are more and more must turn to a different model. And it's a model more of relationships between communities where one can borrow objects, where one can uh, talk talk to people and learn about objects and borrow those objects and display uh, objects, communities, representation of people and and culture, so that we can learn about that those things. And I think more less and less are we going to need to think about oh we have to own those objects to be a great museum. We have to think about more perhaps the greatest museum in the future would be the museum that has the greatest relationships around the world rather than the most objects. And I think that's a, I don't think that's today. Uh, I'm not going to try to say that all my colleagues in the museum world believe that, but I think slowly that's becoming a, a, an understanding that there is a shift. And I think NAGPRA is part of that shift and an awareness that museums don't need to own these objects, but rather can create relationships with tribes, with nations, and to think about how that relationship can develop over a period of time so that we know more about many of these objects that are owned by the tribes that can then be borrowed back to display and to represent these communities. So I think it's a change, but I think it's, it's going to be a very slow process. I think the concept of ownership is very much built into um, part of the way we think of, the, of sort of the economic structure of the 20th century, but I hope not the 21st century. Yes, March. Good question. Yeah.
questions. Um, I do know that um, we, of course, know that there are many tribes who are not federally recognized there, and, and many lost their recognition, many are kind of in gain recognition, um, others are not very interested in finding federal recognition, um, and our policy is that we, I, I don't believe that we have the 332 and uh, our non-federally recognized tribes to date. Um, we haven't actually been asked why every that why every group is unrecognized um, according to litigation. However, our policy states that we certainly would do that and that we would entertain any claim from a non federally recognized group. What we would probably do, Marge, we haven't actually I haven't really had this experience, but we have discussed this in anticipation of such a claim, including such a claim. And what our hope is that we could ask that group to um, join hands or to, to, to have a relationship with a federally recognized tribe who could help them um, so that we could transfer to that entity to claim. Okay, so we would ask them to help, get help, um, and join hands with a federally recognized entity. Um, and we haven't had that, as I said, but we're also willing to entertain claims. We also have not um, received a claim from a Canadian group yet. That could very easily happen. Um, so as a group, um, we make recommendations to the director of the museum. The director, of course, will be in conversation with the museum and have to make his decision and take that to the trustees of the university. Um, but generally, I would say that the university is very supportive of um, coming up with thinking creatively and to really try to support the community. Um, we have, in fact, developed pro um, ideas for pro-reconciliation um, agreements and also pro-ownership agreements. Um, and we have proposed a pro-ownership agreement to one entity within Alaska that is in the proposal situated the objects in Alaska. We have, because of our Tungit collection, it's, it's, um, was so well documented and very carefully, the collection was created by George Jacobs and Tungit um, over 30 years, 90 years. And so that collection is really a strong interest for the village that is a great interest to, to the community. Um, we've developed a website so that people can see all the items and read all the items in that, associated with that collection. Um, so our university has been very helpful in coming up with creative ideas of pro-reconciliation and pro-ownership. Um, we did have one example of a claim also that we um, did not agree um, in our, our claim in the most detailed and for a mask in the collection and it was a hard bug mask back. Um, and we, we did claim the object sacred object and we studied Frank Speck's work very closely and Frank Speck actually did a study of masking traditions along the eastern seaboard and on the back of the mask was the maker of the mask and the price that the mask was sold for. So we worked very hard to try to understand and we came to the finding that we did not agree with the claim um, for this mask and the sacred object. What we did though is make a recommendation to that we would like to, regardless, return the object on loan to the tribe and make it available to them. Um, and we discussed this with the community and they received this offer. And at the immediately they, they were not interested in doing that at first, but they were disappointed that um, they didn't feel that the object had been met the definition as defined in the law. Um, but then about two years later, with a new um, administration um, in um, the head of the tribe, um, one day the phone rang and uh, this woman said that they had just gone through the file and, and that they had seen our letter and they 
past if you are still interested in running the mass data. And I said, of course we were, and we actually got to try it and build it right over to that. And I had it there for a period of almost 10 years now. Um, and so that's one example of us. You know, I, I think that um, people in this museum as anthropologists are already very sensitive to the idea that issues and interests and um, and have a strong interest in supporting the Native communities and trying to integrate and work through um, and build in relationships through that interest. So that's one example, I think, that's a very good one of our goodwill and intention to <laughs> try to work with now partners. So um, that's the only example of one that has a good example. It tells you quite a lot about the university's <laughs> setting up and the needs of the university to take care of the mass. Sure. No. No, no, no. We can, and I think that'll be a good good conversation that we can have. Uh, it's getting perhaps a little too specific in detail at that point for, for, for everyone in the audience. Perhaps one last question, and then we'll uh, I want to wrap it up. Please. <laughs> it was awesome. You know, I really appreciate the good work that you all have been doing for a long time and the things that you've done and the impressive panel that you've been on. It's been really great. But I just wanted to ask uh, in terms of community involvement, you guys are working with with the Center of the Community and you know, I mean you have you have a great system in Canada, but you know, I just want to have you point it out that you know, there's a contrast. we haven't up to this point because of the being in litigation but uh, we follow our attorney's advice and if he says you know stay back hold back but when we came up here we pretty much give it the reins up and see if we go for it <laughs> and it, it is something that really needs to publicized, the story needs to be told, not just in the uh, Thorpe case, but in, the, in other cases, you know. Uh, that one's more so out in the public because of the name and what he did in the past, but <clears throat> if you talk to any other family, uh, tr uh, families of any tribe, their loved ones are just as important he was to his family. So yes, it's uh, it needs to be brought out and maybe some judges will be reading some of this stuff or uh, tri not tribal, but governmental leaders, state legislatures, uh, Congress, everyone needs to be informed of this. And when, when we do it, we need to do it in the correct way true way, not be misleading anyone, because uh, we 
what you say out there, they take it to heart and they think, you know, they put a lot behind it. And you're misquoting something. It's going to come back and get you later. So, yeah, I, I feel like we need to really move forward. Let me turn the question back to you now. In what manner, anyway, in what way? That's called social media and just sort of taking over. <laughs> Well, ho hopefully, in fact, tonight we've started or we've continued some of that. And we, by, do, by live streaming this and to have this on the web so people will be able to watch this and listen to this into the future, we'll begin helping with that pressure. Because I agree with you. I think that's very important. Because in many respects, NAGPRA is a law that I, I don't think a lot of people know a lot about. But I think the Jim Thorpe case has, has galvanized a lot of interest in this issue. And I think it's, a, it's an individual case, but it's a case that really can open up the, the, the issues and the discussion into a, the national framework of a wrong from the past that needs to be righted, a wrong that we, we have to recognize, and to think forward of, through how we can do that in terms of human remains and important objects that need to be returned. Um, to the nations, uh, to the tribes in the United States. I think also I just wanted to mention that I think John's point is very important, the international realm. I think more and more we're going to move in that direction also because there are a lot of human remains, a lot of materials in, um, internet, in museums around the world. But I think we also have to think about indigenous people in other parts of the world and, and the ability for them to get back their materials, their human remains. Uh, and we have to think about that and begin to, to discuss how the same type of activities that are taking place here in the United States can take place, whether it's in Mexico, or perhaps in Argentina, or perhaps in, in other parts of Europe or Africa. So I think this is a, a part of a conversation that, in some sense, starts large, focuses on Jim Thorpe, and then again, opens up again to a very large conversation at the international realm. And I think this will be very important over the next um, perhaps five days, five years, and 50 years. I think this is something that all of us can participate in. I want to thank all of the panelists for your uh, words and wisdom and your concepts and your ideas. Thank you very much for coming here and expressing some very important uh, ideas to all of us. Thank you. I again want to thank 
uh, both Suzanne Schoenharjo and Mary Catherine Nagel, the playwrights for the play uh, My Father's Bones. Thank you very much. And to the audience, please join us in a reception just outside the uh, lecture hall upstairs. There's an open reception where you'll have an opportunity to talk to the panelists, talk to some of the actors, uh, talk to the playwrights and other people, and continue this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.